Welcome along. It's two. It's actually 2022. Uh, I'll tell you what, the years are just rushing past. Anyway, 2022, Happy New Year to everyone. Not only the Zoom is here at the moment, but all the people in the world that may be looking at this in the future. Happy New Year for 2022. You might be looking at it in 15 years time, but 2022, Happy New Year. Um, I'm David Lindo, also known as Jürgen Berla. This is in conservation with it's the third series is the first of 2022 my guest this evening this afternoon depending on where you are is ian parsons a man who is in total love with vultures am i right in saying that ian i think so yes i think that's a fair a fair assumption and also uh ian um writes a very 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 good column in Birdwatcher magazine, which is Britain's best selling, in fact, it probably is the world's most biggest selling wild birding magazine. Um, I love reading his articles, he normally writes about a particular species, but looks at it or looks at that particular species in a, in a very different light from a very different angle. Um, just to give you a bit of background on Ian, um, he spent uh, 20 years as a forest ranger working with a wide variety of wildlife, um, ranging from dormice, dormice to uh, to goshawks. Whereabouts were you actually doing your your forestry work? I started off in East Anglia in Thetford Forest in the early nineties. Uh, then worked on the Dorset Hampshire border for four years, and then came back down to my native Devon and uh, worked well all over Devon, um, but principally around the Exeter area. Okay, and speaking of Devon, where are you? And by the way, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, David. I hope you are too. Um, I would just quickly like to say hello, Helios, who's up in the top of the screen, someone who lives in my village in Exmadura. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm in mid Devon, so right smack bang in the geographical centre of Devon, just to the north of Dartmoor, in a, a little village. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's a lovely, lovely spot, but it's not Exmadura. <laughs> no, no, it's um, in 2020 or sorry, in 2012, even you set up Griffin Holidays, which is a specialist birding tour company uh, running tours to Extra Majuna. Mm. And of course, you started writing articles for Birdwatching magazine then as well. Um, and in 2020, uh, the subject of the reason why we're here now, I suppose, is the fact that you wrote a book which was published then called A Vulture Landscape. If you've got a copy, you can just hold up. <laughs> to have a copy just here yeah there you go um yeah i mean i've, I've lived in extra a few times i've still got a place out there in the same village that helios is in um and you know we split our time between the two places obviously last couple of years it's not been quite so um straightforward to do that uh i first went to extra back in the early 90s and was just blown away by it absolutely blown away and then as you always tell people to do, look up. And I looked up and there were vultures and that was it. That was my life. Um, I love them. They're, they're brilliant. They're fantastic birds. And um, they're very important birds, but just spending time watching them is just, uh, just amazing. Just amazing. For those who are not familiar with Extra Majuda, um, can you kind of give us a, a, a potted history of what Extra Majuda is or where it is and what it means to you? It's a huge region. Um, it's I think it's about twice the size of Wales, yet it's only got um, a million or so people living in it. It's mainly empty of people, which makes it a great place for wildlife. It's to the west of Madrid. If you drew a straight line from Madrid to Portugal, you'd go through Extra Madura. It's split into two provinces, Cáceres in the north and um, Badajoz in the south. And it's just a, it's a fantastic mixture of habitats. One minute you can be in high mountains, the next minute you can be on flat rolling, flat or rolling plains, and then they're intersected by steep uh, rivers that cut through these plains. You've got lots of extensive grazing in some places. You've got the Hesa, which is a principally an agricultural system where it's, it's, it's basically evergreen oats that are pruned to, to be quite low growing, cast a lot of shade, which is very important because the weather out there can be it can be extreme, as the name almost suggests. Um, in the summer, it can get into the 40s degrees centigrade. 
Um, and in the winter, you, you can be minus two, minus three on a, on a cold January morning. So it's a, it's a real variety of temperature, a variety of habitat, a real lack of people, and just uh, just full of some amazing wildlife. Um, you know, David, you know it very, very well, but you, you've got three species of vulture, you've got five species of eagle, you've got both bustards, you've got sand grouse, you've got some amazing birds um, and amazing mammals as well. I mean, you know, the um, beech martin, there's uh, Egyptian mongoose, there's, um, there's otters that you see fairly regularly. It's just, a, it's a fantastic place. The people are brilliant. Um, the food's lovely, especially if you like pork. Uh, they do have a bit of a pork fixation. Um, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's just one of those places. I found it very, very friendly. The first ever time I was there, it was, it was wonderful. It's changed a lot since the early 1990s, um, but the essence is still there and the wildlife is just fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, as you probably know, I'm actually based in Extremadura. Um, I'm in Brexile. Um, <laughs> But my first visit to Extremadura was actually 12 years ago, um, 12 years ago in March, and I've never looked back. And it's yeah. one of those places, especially now when I'm kind of hanging out here a lot, I mean, mostly down to the pandemic, I've kind of been in this area. And it's one of those amazing places where any corner you turn, there could be something interesting to see. And often, which the thing that drives me the most is the fact that you are often the only person there. And I, for example, went to a valley in, in uh, Catholic province, Northern province, um, found Dipper there and um, nearby there was a Benelli's eagle flying around, which apparently was the first for 25 years oh, wow. um, in that region. But um, the other thing I discovered was the fact that when I looked on eBird, there hadn't been a visitation. I was there in September or August. There hadn't been anyone there since the February before, and even then, it was just one visit. So it just shows you how underwatched the whole place is. And for me, that that's one of the major drivers of me being here. The fact that it's you know you can just find your own place, and you have the, like miles upon miles, you know, on your own as a birder to explore. There's some there's some massive spaces that just don't have you know. There's very few public roads, particularly in in Cafres province. I um, mean, in the part that I got a place in. Um, very few public roads. There's lots of tracks, but sort of vehicle access accessible roads. There's, a, there's very little. So there's vast swathes of land that people just don't go to. And you, you know, you wonder. You do think, like, what is in there? What's hiding away there? Um, you know, I when I was living out there, I I turned up a pair of white rump swift very close to where I live, and just assumed, oh, well, they're going to be well known. People are going to know they're here, and they didn't. It was, you know, they were they were my white rump swifts, if you like, and um, you know that you can just do that. And I, you know, I can remember being there watching Spanish Imperial Eagle and picking up on white rump swift, and and that's that's extra Madura. I mean, that's what happens, you know. And there's always vultures in the sky and on the cliffs and and just around. Yeah, what I find is that a lot of people come to extra Madura and they come specifically just for the sort of. The, 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 the typical species that you find in that region. You mentioned them earlier, bustards, the eagles, the sand grouse, you know, but they tend to go to the same five or six places. Yeah. And I often talk to people who don't realize that I'm hanging out in extra Madrid all the time. And I say, oh yeah, I'm on Fragway, which is an amazing place, by the way, folks, um, north of Catharus. And it's, it's, uh, there's, it's dominated by this, it's a huge nat uh, national park as it were, but it's dominated by this massive cliff, which they call Peña, Falcon, and from there you can see, you know, many species of birds of prey easily. Um, but it's like that is the epicenter for, for a lot of people who, and they think that's the only place where you can see, you know, vultures, that's the only place where you can see this, that, and the other. When there are many places dotted around the whole regions where you can actually see the very same birds, maybe not as, you know, spectacularly as, as uh, Mont Fragway, but certainly you can see them. So um, for me, it's a place that you can really practice the whole idea of exploring, exploring, get out there. Doesn't matter where you are, middle of an urban area or in the middle of the countryside, explore. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, Mon Fragway is a fantastic place and I do take clients there, but we go there because it's become the place to go to rather than to see the species. We go there on the, the second full day, but by then, 
we've already picked up on all the other on all the main species you're going to see in Monfragüe. I think basically the only new species we tend to get there is um, crested tit. You know, all the other all the big star birds we've already picked up on in areas where you won't see a soul other than yourself. And you know, it's just fantastic place. Yeah, you can't visit Extra Madura without going to Monfragüe, which reminds me, I must mention that uh, the In Conservation With series is sponsored by uh, the Deputación de Cáceres, which actually is the region, in fact, the Northern Region's uh, Tourism Board, uh, that's Cáceres region, and also by Leica Birding and Nature. So thank you. I, I think I was so excited about talking <laughs> to Ian about extra Madura and vultures, I forgot to mention that. So there you go. So let's 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 just let's dive in with vultures. Let's let's find out from you, Ian, what is a vulture? What's it what's a vulture all about about? Well vultures are are carrion feeders. There is one very unusual vulture in southern Africa that, that isn't, but the vast majority of vultures are carrion feeders. They clean up the dead basically. Um, they're split into two groups. You've got the old world vultures and the new world vultures. Uh, the new world vultures being in the Americas and the old world vultures being in Europe, Africa and Asia. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about, about those um, in a bit. But basically that the main um, blueprint, if you like, for a vulture is a big bird with big, broad, sail-like wings that does the absolute minimal of effort when it's flying. It just, it floats through the sky on those wings. They drift through the sky and they're always looking for feeding opportunities and it's amazing how um how adept they are at finding them as well but yeah they're fantastic flyers they can fly huge distances they can fly amazing heights i mean there's a bird in africa called the repels vulture that's been recorded at over eleven thousand um, feet up uh, unfortunately it hit a jet engine which is why they know it was a, a repels vulture and it caused the plane to make an emergency landing that's the that's the highest um height of a bird ever recorded. I mean, I think it's something like seven kilometers up. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. They're fantastic flyers. Um, I'd say they've got these big, broad, sail-like wings, wings, and they uh, they use them to just catch the thermals, catch the air currents. Uh, I describe it in the book as riding the rivers of air, and, and they're just they're just so perfect at it. And and they look for car carcasses, and that's their, their main principal role is to clean up carcasses. Okay, well, you got you got a uh, a brief little kind of uh, picture show for us. Yeah. So, folks, if you want to see this in its full glory, don't forget to switch. If you are watching in gallery gallery view, switch it to uh, to um, speaker view, and then you'll see the whole screen. And you need to because these birds are just amazing. Okay. Well, um, I start, I start off with uh, with the cover of the book again. Just a just a little reminder. It's um, it's still available from all good publishers and all good bookshops. Um, so the first bird uh, we're going to talk about is the griffin vulture. Um, and this is the, this is your typical vulture in Spain. This is the bird you see more of um, than any of the other vulture species. It's a big bird. That wingspan is around about 2.7 meters. Um, this is an adult bird. You can tell that by its pale bill. Uh, they're huge. They nest on cliff ledges. Um, they nest in colonies. Some of the colonies are massive. David already mentioned Peña Falcon in uh, Monfragüe. There's a massive colony there. Although it's not the biggest one in Monfragüe, there is another one on the far side of Monfragüe that's bigger. Um, they, they're just fantastic birds. Right now, in January, they'll be um, thinking about nesting. They'll be, um, be gathering up bits of... Um, bits of stick and putting it on the ledges they normally lay their eggs at the end of this month uh so although in britain you know if you're watching this the weather's miserable it's cold in extra Madura, the vultures are um you know the griffin vultures are already preparing their um their nests for the next generation second species is the black vulture now if you're watching in america that would have confused you but we'll get on to that in a minute this is the biggest vulture species um in europe um, it's pretty much in the old world. It's huge. You hear people talking about uh, white-tailed eagles being the, the, a flying barn door. 
Uh, well, this is the barn as well as the door. It's massive. Its wingspan's just under three meters. Um, and you know, that's, that sounds big. What I always do with the clients is you get a tape measure out and you measure out three meters on the ground and you physically look at it. And it just, it's, it's incredible. They're huge birds. You can see their wing is quite literally a plank. Uh, this is a young bird. You can tell that because it's still got um, black, short black downy feathers on the top of its head and it's underwing coverts. The, uh, the, the front edge of those underwings is very, very dark. Um, you'll notice as well its tail is quite short. When I'm out with clients in Exmadura and you're, you're watching birds, there's lots of big birds in the sky. Vultures have short tails, whereas the eagles have long tails. And the good way of, of looking at it, because it's always very hard to judge size when you're looking up into a, into a blue sky. But look at the wing width of that bird compared to the tail length. And the wing width, uh, the wing depth, if you like, is a lot bigger than the, the tail length. If that tail was longer than the wing depth, then it's not going to be a vulture. And it's a good way of, um, of just at a distance, you know, often birds can be a long way away, is looking at the ratio between the wing and the tail. Uh, Spanish imperial eagle, which is, um, a, you know, a species that everyone likes to see out in Exmadura, can look very vulture-like at a distance. Um, and it's a very dark bird underneath, but it's got that long tail, which is what distinguishes it. So I'm calling this the black vulture. In America, there's another species of vulture called a black vulture, um, which doesn't look anything like this. And in fact, is a lot, lot smaller. Now, because of the fact that these birds have got the same name, it's now been, uh, it's now been officially changed. This, this bird we're looking at now, the European black vulture, is now officially known as the cinerous vulture, which personally I think is a ridiculous name because cinerous means ash gray. And there's a bird called a cinerous harrier. And if you look that up, you'll see it's very similar in color to a bird that you'll know in Britain as the hen harrier. Well, that is not as gray, that's black. Now I will qualify that because I'm colorblind and I see the world completely differently to everybody else. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I just, I, I don't see colors like you do, but I do know that that's black and it's not as gray. Now it's a young bird and young birds are darker. As they get older, they go a much darker brown colour rather than black. But even, even then, that still makes a mockery of the name Cinerous Vulture. I don't know why the British Ornithological Union have decided to follow um, the Americans and, and, and change it to Cinerous. I think it's a mistake. In other countries in Europe, in Spain, it is called the Black Vulture, Butre Negra. But in other countries, Europe and Germany, for example, it's called the Monk vulture and um you know that's a better name and we'll see that a bit later in another photo when we have a look at it so yeah that's the second species it's the biggest species it's huge it's fantastic even though it's so, so big though it nests in trees and a black vulture's nest in a tree is massive it's, it's about the size of a double bed so you imagine a double bed in a tree and sometimes four or five foot deep and that's a black vulture's nest and uh yeah there, there's something to see the other species um, in Extremadura is this one, the Egyptian vulture. Um, now, this is a small vulture, but when I say small, it's still about the size of a grey heron. So it's still a big bird. Its wingspan is about 1.7 metres. Um, they're, uh, they're strange looking birds. They've got that egg yellow face. Uh, they've got quite a small puny beak on them. And unlike the first two that you saw, these aren't birds are able to feed on an unopened carcass. So griffin vultures and black vultures are very strong birds. They will rip open a carcass. So a dead cow, it can rip it open. The Egyptian vulture doesn't have that ability. It's, it doesn't have the bill, it doesn't have the strength. These are, these, these birds do the dirtiest of deeds. They're the ones that clean up what the bigger vultures leave behind. Um, they'll take little scraps of food um, and they'll, you know, they'll feed on dung pig farms, there's some big pig farms now in, in the north of Extremadura, and, and Egyptian vultures are clicked onto these, and they feed on the animals dung, and any food remains there. And it's even changing their habits, because some of these Egyptian vultures are now overwintering in Extremadura. The first two species are residents, whereas the Egyptian vultures always been a migratory bird, always returning back to Africa for the winter. But increasingly, there are more and more Egyptian vultures staying in Extremadura. Um, and they're exploiting a 
the milder winters that are now happening, but also the fact that there's this increased food resource. So rubbish chips as well, they'll sometimes hang around. But yeah, they, they do like pig farms. They've got the, the local Spanish name for them is dung eater, and they do indeed live up to that name. Uh, um, they'll sometimes hang around sewage farms as well. So they don't have the pleasantest of diets, but they're an amazing bird to see. And they're, they're unfortunately an endangered species and they are in decline um, due mainly to us, but we'll get onto that um, later on as well. So this is a typical view of an extra Madura sky, apart from the fact it's got a cloud in it. I mean, normally from about April to October, you don't see white fluffy clouds in extra Madura, it's normally just blue sky. But these are all griffin vultures. Um, there's quite a, an accumulation of them there. And they do this when there's a carcass or there's a good thermal to ride. These were actually honing in on a carcass. Um, people have long wondered how vultures find their food. Uh, you know, how did they detect it? And back in the day, you had people like Darwin, you had Audubon in, in, in America, um, arguing over whether they found it by sight, or whether they found it by smell. And it turns out they do it both ways, but, but not together. So the old world vultures do it by sight, whereas some of the American vultures actually do it by smell. They, unusually for a bird, they can actually detect, um, detect scent. Whereas, whereas these birds, the griffins, do it all by sight. And what happens when you watch vultures come off a colony is they all get up into the air and they spread themselves out um, over the sky. In my book, I sort of describe myself vulture gazing, which is basically you sort of just sitting there, lying back, looking up into the blue sky, and just emptying your mind and watching the vultures drift along it. It's I love doing it. It's such a relaxing thing to do. You don't have to be analysing what you're seeing. You can just lose yourself watching these birds. And you watch them and you sort of think they're just randomly drifting, but they're not. They're always looking. They're always watching at what's going on. They're watching on the ground. They're watching in the sky. And more importantly of all, they're watching what other vultures are doing. Now, they've got good vision. So they spread themselves out over a landscape they always are in touch with two or three other birds visually um, and those birds are in touch with other birds visually and so on and so on i call them visibility chains so you can have um, a vulture maybe 30 kilometers away see something that attracts its attention it might be a dead sheep or it might be a raven or, or black kite which are both very common birds next to them black kites in the summer um, acting as if there's food around that vulture will go and investigate. Well, the vulture that's watching that vulture will change its flight course to investigate what that vulture is doing. And the vulture that's watching that vulture that's watching that vulture will do the same and so on and so forth. So you can have an empty sky. And I can remember taking a client um, and we had a dead sheep. And I said, oh, we'll wait here. There'll be some vultures around in a minute. And there was nothing around. Within about five minutes, we had 70, 80 birds above us. And one bird had seen it. The birds that were watching that bird had seen that bird react. The birds that were watching those birds reacted and they just came in from everywhere. And the sky can go from being empty to having clouds of vultures above very, very quickly. So they find their food in the old world um, using sight. Whereas in the Americas, some of the species can actually smell a chemical called ethyl mercatan, which is basically that, that smell, that smell of decay, of death. And they can pick up on it and they, that helps them find where to go. They then use their sight to actually narrow in on the actual um, on the actual carcass. One of the vultures in America, I think it's the king vulture, doesn't have this ability, but it is clever because it watches what the vultures that can smell are doing. And when they start showing an interest in something, it shows an interest in what they're showing an interest as well. And an interesting little story in the Americas on the big gas pipelines, um, they noticed that the vultures would hang around a leaking gas pipe because the gas has, a, has this chemical in it. They were smelling this gas and they were thinking it was a carcass. And what they did back in the 1920s was notice this and realize that if they actually put more of this chemical into the gas, um, leaks would be detected much quicker. All they got to do is keep an eye on what the vultures are doing. And that's what they did. And you know that's why gas has that smell to it. Um, so if there was a leak in the pipeline, the vultures detect it long before we could, and people would just watch what the vultures were doing and, and find the gas leak. Obviously, the vultures would be disappointed, 
But um, yeah, the, so some vultures, the American vultures can smell, whereas the European, the African, and the Asian ones cannot smell at all. It's a very unusual sense in the bird world, but um, some of the American vultures do have it. So this is a typical site out on the um, Exxon Plain. This is a, a group of griffin vultures. There was a sheep in the midst of that. On the right hand side of the group, you'll see there's a bigger bird. That's the black vulture. This is a full adult. You can see it's got a, a you can just see it's got a bowed head to it. And the cow, the feathers around the back of its neck are quite a brownie colour now. I'm guessing at the colours, by the way, because I have no idea what the colours are. I just read the books and they tell me. But um, that's that's where they get the name the monk vulture. When you look at that um, that you know, that bird there with the bowed head and the, the, the brown collar on the back of its neck, that's where they get the name from. It's certainly not cinerous, ash grey, but monk vulture would be a good name for it. So this sheep, um, I started my watch when the first griffin vulture landed. When they first find the carcass, they don't just go pining straight in. They're quite nervous birds. Um, they don't come down until they've checked out the area, which is why they circle around for ages. You know, you watch them circling, it's that stereotypical image of a vulture. They're checking it out, but as soon as the first one breaks cover and land, then the others come pouring in. And I started my watch, it's a full sheep carcass, Within 60 seconds of the first one landing, there was another 60 birds down on the ground. And within seven minutes, they'd all stopped feeding. The only thing that was left of that sheep was its skull, its backbone, and its, and its ribcage. Everything had gone. There was a few bits of wool hanging around on the grass. But everything had gone. Seven minutes to get rid of a carcass. And that's, that's a great thing from a farmer's point of view. Um, if you're keeping livestock and something dies, you've got to get rid of it. And that involves bureaucracy, it inv especially post BSE, it involves all sorts of um, form filling, you have to ring people up, someone has to drive out, collect it, it costs money, it costs time, the vulture finds it, it's gone very, very quickly, very efficiently, they, their stomachs, they've got the best digestion in the world, um, you know, Gavis has got nothing from these guys, okay, their, their stomach acid is so strong, um, they can deal with lots of diseases that we are very scared of. So bovine tuberculosis, not a problem. They can just eat it. Even anthrax, they will just consume and just destroy it. So they're in very important, um, a very important part of the ecosystem. They clean it up. They keep it clean. They keep it healthy. They're doing a, a really important role. They are, if you like, the ultimate recyclers. Now, when you talk about vultures feeding, most people think of that long neck. So this is an adult griffin vulture. Um, you can tell it's an adult by that bill. It's a very pale bill. Um, and you can see the long neck there. It's a very muscular neck, by the way. That vulture comes from the Latin to tear. And they literally do live up to their name. They use their feet to anchor the carcass. And they, they clasp part of the skin with a bill. And they use their neck muscles to tear it open. That's where the name vulture comes from. So we think um, of vultures of having bare necks so that they can stay clean. It's a hygiene issue, but it isn't. That's probably a secondary reason. The principal driver between behind that vulture having a, a bare neck like that is actually all about keeping cool. It's about firmer regulation. So as I said earlier, um, extra Madura can get very hot in the summer. July through to August, it can often um, get up into the 40s centigrade every day. And out on the plain, as you can see in the picture in the back there, there is no shade. And griffin, you'll never see a griffin vulture seeking shade. You'll see a lot of the other Exxon birds seeking shade in the summer, but griffin vultures don't. They're very, very efficient at regulating their body temperature. Um, this is a bird in the summer. OK, I know that straight away just by looking at it. So if you look at its rough, the, the, the group of feathers at the back of the neck there, they're flattened. If you look at its feathers on its chest, they're parted, almost like it's got its top button undone and opened up its chest. Its legs, it's exposed its legs, they're bare legs. If this was, this was a bird now, this time of year, sat on a cliff ledge, its neck would be hunched up, its ruff would be up, its chest feathers would be up close across its neck and it would be hiding its bare legs as well. This is a bird that's keeping itself cool. Now, just by changing their posture, they can change the amount of bare skin that's exposed from 7% to 32%. Uh, and it's incredible, just, just purely on posture, and it's all about regulating their temperature. And like I say, you'll never see a griffin vulture in the shade. 
You might find the great busted in the shade panting, and you won't find the griffin vulture. It's all about them keeping cool. So that's why they have bare necks. It's not about keeping clean, it's about keeping cool and not overheating. And by adjusting their body posture, they can cool themselves down or warm themselves up. They, they're just fantastic birds. Now, I just mentioned bustards. Extra Madura, if, if you're in Europe, Extra Madura, is, for me, has got to be the most amazing birding destination there is. I mean, it's got the real A to Z of birds. It's got everything from azure wing magpies to zitting sister colors. Um, I could have put hundreds and hundreds of photos of the birds they've got here, but I thought I'd just take one letter. So I've gone for B. So this is this is great busted. There's also little busted as well. So you've got huge birds. Great busted is the um, heaviest flying bird there is. Um, so in the B, uh, under the letter B, you've got busteds, you've got black red starts, the opposite end of the size spectrum. But what a gorgeous bird they are. This one's actually nesting on my patio in the village. Um, in a little hole in the wall, right outside the kitchen door. And it was just fantastic watching them coming in and feeding. They're, these are very much an urban bird. They're right up David Street. These are real urban birds. Um, you find them in, in the heart of the cities, but you also find them right out in the wilds as well. They're just they're fantastic. They're brilliant. This nest, when it fledged, caused me chaos because I'd left the back door open and I had two young black red stock, newly fledged birds, decided they were going to explore the house. Um, I've never before tried to herd black red starts out of a house, but it's not recommended. It took me quite a while. So you've got busted, you've got black red starts, and then you've got these. These are just rainbows. The bee eater, so another bee. Um, they are summer visitors, spring and summer visitors. They're just delightful. They really are just fantastic birds. And I, I would say every single client I've ever taken, regardless or not whether they are into photography, will try and get a photo of a bee eater at some point on their tour because they're just stunning. Some very, very colourful birds there, but they don't all have to be multicoloured. You've got this bird, the blue rock thrush, and Helios, if you're still there, you will recognise this bird. This was um, Helios, my friend in the village, uh, is a professional wildlife photographer and um, helped me get this photo. So thank you, Helios. Um, they're they, these are beauties. These are males. Um, the males are this lovely blue colour. The females are, are, are duller in colour. They're fantastic birds. Again, a bird you can find in the middle of nowhere on a rocky ledge or, or even in towns and on bridges. They're, um, they're a fantastic bird. So you've got your bustards, your black red starts, your bee eaters, your blue rock thrush. But when you're talking about Eximadura, you've got to talk about raptors. And the bee one is the Benelli's eagle. And again, Helios, thank you for this bird as well. Um, Benelli's eagles are, wow, they're just, they're awesome very very powerful birds of prey they're a lot smaller than the golden eagle but their killing talent is, is massive um and they are i don't know how you put it politely but they're psychopathic there's not a lot of birds that are going to argue with the nanny's eagle even the golden eagle steers, steers clear of these birds they're very very tenacious predators they're a bird that's been in decline um they they have suffered at the hands of man across europe but Eximadura is a good place to see them. They're, they're just fantastic. Uh, um, they're pure predators, pure, pure predators. And um, seeing one of these close up as I did that day with this one right in front of me was just an experience I will never forget. They're, um, yeah, incredibly powerful birds. But getting back to the vultures, this is a, a griffin vulture. It's an adult. Again, you can tell that, A, because it's, it's molt pattern. But also you can see that uh, pale bill and the rough around the neck is very pale as well. You'll notice as well the depth of those wings compared to the length of that tail. That short tail again, that characteristic of vultures um, is there. So these big broad sails are what they use. They're very, very efficient in terms of, of expending energy. They ride the rivers of the air. They seek out the thermals. They use the orographic flow, the landscape creating air currents to move themselves around. They don't like flapping. You'll very rarely see vultures flapping hard once they're up off the ground. They avoid doing so, they're very clever. They can, they can detect air pressure changes and they use that. And a lot of, um, a lot of these uh, predator drones that the, the militaries use now, they base their technology on the vulture wing loading because it's such an efficient thing to do. But unfortunately vultures 
are on the threat. Most of the species in the world are endangered or critically endangered. The griffon vulture isn't, but it's not immune to it. Now you're probably all aware of um, the, the diclofenac poisoning in Asia um, back in the 1980s and the 1990s. It was devastating. A close relative of the griffon vulture, a bird called the white rump vulture, was once the most numerous large raptor on the planet. It numbered in its millions. Within 20 years, it was down to less than 10,000 birds and still remains critically endangered of extinction. From the most populous large raptor on the planet to crit critically endangered in 20 years and all down to a drug called diclofenac. Now it's not some horrible nasty poison that people go spreading deliberately to kill birds. It's a medicine. You may well have used it yourself. It's, a, it's a, an anti-inflammatory um, drug, but they use it in cattle and they use it in sheep. And unfortunately for birds, it's lethally toxic. It's not for us mammals, but for the birds it is. And for birds that feed on dead cattle and dead sheep, that's it, that's the end of it. 99% almost of the, white bat, of the white rumped vulture population disappeared because of this vet drug. No one knew what was happening. They were dying in huge numbers across the Indian subcontinent. No one knew why. As a result, rabies has increased because there were more carcasses being left. The feral dogs increased because they were feeding on these, these carcasses and so on and so forth. And then there was a problem with rabies. Vultures were keeping that in check. Luckily, literally at the, at the last minute of the last hour, they discovered what was causing it. And India, Pakistan, all these governments in the area, Iran, they banned the use of diclofenac. The European Union haven't. The product is still licensable in Spain right now, where we have the best population of Griffin vultures in Europe, the best population of black vultures in Europe, the best population of Egyptian vultures in Europe. It's stupid, it's crazy, it doesn't make sense. Luckily, there are alternatives available, and for whatever reason, probably price, they're being used in Spain as opposed to diclofenac. But technically, by law, it could be used in areas where these vultures are, and yet it kills them, and it kills them in vast numbers. It doesn't make sense. You've, you've got to wonder what it's all about, um, whether it's um, vested interests or not. But diclofenac's not the only poisoning that vultures suffer from. There's another one called sentinel poisoning. Um, sentinel poisoning is so cool because poachers know in Africa in particular when, when they're hunting things like elephant or rhino and they're after ivory or rhino horn um, for the black market they know that if they shoot an animal vultures would gather very quickly but the rangers in these national parks also know that vultures would gather very quickly and if they see vultures gathering quickly these rangers would go and investigate and can often catch the poachers so the poachers have decided they don't want to be caught so the way of doing that is to kill all the vultures. So they deliberately put out poison carcasses. The vultures come in and feed. They die. Um, lots of other animals die. Lots of other birds die. They die. The chicks in the nest die. And huge colonies are just wiped out in an instant. It's a massive, massive problem for African vultures. Repels vulture, a bird that is occasionally coming to Spain now, um, is a bird that's critically endangered. They're getting poisoned. By the hundreds and they're, they're slow breeders they don't breed till they're five years old they, this is a population that can't recover the following spring um, so sentinel poisoning is a big big issue another issue is incidental poisoning and the bird that suffers the most at this is the um, egyptian vulture egyptian vultures like i said earlier they don't feed on the big carcasses they can't access them but they'll feed on little scraps and people that are putting out poison bait to kill foxes um, or, or feral dogs or what have you, hiding these little scraps of meat where these mammals will find them, are also poisoning Egyptian vultures. Because Egyptian vultures, when they're foraging for food, will spend a lot of time wandering around the ground checking things out. They'll find these little parcels of meat and they'll eat them and they'll die. And this has had a big knock-on effect on Europe's population, which has really plummeted over recent years. You'll get, um, you know, they're, they're migratory birds. And a lot of these big birds are not very good at crossing open water. Birds in southern Italy would, would fly across um, Sicily, Malta to Tunisia. The young birds, this year's young birds, would follow the adult birds. 
but because the population is so low now, a lot of the young birds are leaving on their own. They have no adults to follow. They're inexperienced and they get lost. And a vulture lost over water is a vulture that unfortunately is in a lot of trouble. And the actual recruitment rate into the, Europe, into the Egyptian vulture population um, in Southern Europe had suffered so badly because of this poisoning of the adults that these migratory birds just weren't making it over to Africa or back again in the spring. Uh, there's a brilliant organization that I've got to give a shout to called uh, Vulture Conservation Foundation, who have done fantastic work with vultures across Europe, across the world. Um, and they've been doing some brilliant work with Egyptian vulture. They're the ones that have put the bearded vulture back into the Alps. The, the work that they've done on that has been brilliant. They're doing all sorts of great work across the Mediterranean area with black vultures, griffin vultures, countries that should have vultures are getting them back thanks to the Vulture Conservation Foundation. Um, and in Spain as well, you've got SEO, which is the bird life partner, um, a bit like the RSPB in Britain. They do tremendous conservation work as well uh, with vultures. So thank you, SEO, as well, because without SEO, without uh, Vulture Conservation Foundation, our skies would be a much emptier place. Um, the, the, the other poison issue is lead poisoning. It's something that we're well aware of um, across the world with raptors. People go shooting with lead ammunition um, and that lead ammunition gets into the environment. If, uh, if a deer is shot with a high velocity lead round, that lead round on hitting the um, deer will often break up into lots of little bits and those lead particles stay in the flesh. Now, sometimes deer are just cold because there's, there's too many of them. They're not being cold to be eaten by the hunter and they leave them out. They think by leaving them out, they're helping the vultures but they're actually leaving out a carcass that is laced with lead that we all know is lethally poisonous. In the Americas, the Californian condor, a fantastic bird, but it was a bird that was just in, in trouble of extinction in the 1980s. I think it was down to something like 76 birds were left. That was it, total in the wild. And a fantastic project managed to capture them all and captive breed them. They were then released back into the wild, but the population wasn't recovering at the rate it should be. And they discovered that the reason it wasn't recovering was because there was so much lead being used in the environment through shooting, through hunting, that the lead was getting into the food chain and killing these vultures. It was impairing their breeding. Lead is, isn't something that will kill an animal quickly, but it does impair them. It impairs their judgment. And you wonder when you see a story of a vulture flying into a, a wind turbine or an electric pylon, what impaired its judgment for it to do that? It's very easy to see the dead vulture and say, oh, that was the pylon that killed that bird. But it could have been lead that's affected its ability to avoid that in the first place, to recognise it. Lead is an insidious threat. Anyway, luckily, California took decisive action, the state of California, and it banned all lead in all hunting ammunition. It can be done. It should be done everywhere. It's been done in a lot of countries over wetlands because of, of lead getting into the wetlands, but it should be done everywhere. We shouldn't be losing vultures to lead poisoning. We shouldn't be losing vultures to any poisoning. Um, they're fantastic birds. They're beautiful birds. This is a young juvenile griffin. Um, and you can tell this is a youngster because A, it's bill very dark um, compared to the pair of the adults. And uh, also the rough, the feathers on the back of the neck are brown, they're not white. And look at that head, that's Persa white. That is a head that's not been in a carcass yet. It's not been stuffed in, into some cow's guts just yet. It's a newly fledged bird. So that's my brief little um, run around some of the photos. Hope you enjoy them. Yeah, I loved it, it's fantastic. Thank you very much for taking us through the, uh, the world of the vulture. It's interesting in Extremadura, um, luckily the population seemed to be quite healthy, I think must be, um, correct me if I'm wrong, just under 4,000 pairs of, of uh, griffin vulture, maybe 900 plus pairs of black vulture. And you could be practically anywhere in extra Medina. I've seen them in Merida, which is, um, this is one by, by my way, on my back. Um, I've seen them in the city of Merida flying over practically on a daily basis. I remember when I was in lockdown in 2020. Was it 2020 this all started? I can't remember that. Yeah, 2020. Uh, and, um, you know, it's been on terrace and one of the birds I saw all the time were griffin, griffin and black vultures. And I actually call them urban birds because they were in my yeah, yeah. environment. I mean, but you, can come I, out, you can walk out the supermarket in the middle of a city and look up and there's vultures drifting overhead. I mean, that's yes. just mind blowing. 
That's amazing. So they're doing, they're doing you know, well in, in extra Medina, but what's the situation, for example, in Europe? I know we've talked about the general situation, which is that a lot of birds are in trouble, uh, a lot of species as well as individuals. But for example, I've been to places like Serbia where they're very proud of their colony of like 16 birds on a, on a cliff. Um, and I know that other vultures, such as the, uh, the bearded vulture, which I haven't talked about tonight, um, has been subject of lots of uh, reintroductions around, like in the Pyrenees and the Alps. Is the, is the picture looking better, at least in Europe? I, it is, definitely. Um, you know, thanks to lots of organisations, like I said, the, um, the VCF, the Vulture Conservation Foundation, have done a lot of work. They're doing a lot of work in the Balkans, in, in the former Yugoslavia with reintroductions of griffins and black vultures, they should be there, they've been wiped out. Uh, I know, I saw the other day, <clears throat> Sardinia is getting um, a, a fresh lot of, of griffin vultures to be released back to Sardinia. Again, where they should be, there's, there's loads of great work going on. And the good thing about this work is that it doesn't just, they don't just release the big birds, they make sure the habitat and the food is there first. So with the bearded vulture in the Alps, Instead of just trying to captive breed bearded vultures and release them, they actually concentrated on getting the habitat right, building up their natural food, which for bearded vultures were, were animals like the chamois, a type of mountain goat. That had suffered badly. So it's about, it's about getting the whole picture right. And when, you, when you're look, talking about vultures, they're, your, they're, they're not apex predators, but they're at the top of the food chain, if you like. Um, so if you get it right for them, you're getting it right for so many other species, birds, mammals, plants, reptiles. Um, they're a great conservation tool, you know, focus on them. But the work you do to get to that point helps so many other birds. There's a real, um, a real positive air about vultures in Europe, but there's still that massive threat of poisoning. Yeah, you and I were both born in that place called Great Britain, um, which is not part of Europe, apparently. <laughs> and and recently there's been um a few examples of vultures turning up in 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 britain i mean there's been there's actually currently i think in ireland an egyptian vulture and last year or maybe the year before last there was a bearded vulture that toured around the uk and it's interesting to think actually um that griffin vulture i think the last record of griffin vulture in britain was back in the 18 late 1800s do you think, um, I know that rewilding is a big thing at the moment, do you think that there is a possibility that vultures could be, re well, actually, when I say reintroduced, I don't know if they were there in the first place, but do you think that vultures could ever survive as a, you know, a population in the UK? Well, look, the one thing vultures don't like, especially griffin vultures, is rain. And that's gonna be a big problem for them. Um, Watching vultures in the rain, they just they hate it. They just sit on their cliffs and look so miserable. Uh, the record of griffin vulture in Britain is a bit iffy. Um, and it was also actually the Republic of what is now the Republic of Ireland that it, it was shot in or turned up dead in or something. But um, the, uh, the bearded vultures that have come over, we've had two young birds. They've come from the, the breeding um, project. They're actually wild born birds, but one of their parents at least was a captive bred bird that had been released into the wild. Now, as that population increases, the chances of getting a bearded vulture drifting over increases as well. Vultures are great wanderers. They, they've got fantastic wings. They'll wherever the air currents take them, they'll wander. And these birds, they don't breed till they're five. So the youngsters, once they've fledged and become independent, they often just travel. They see the world, if you like. Um, griffin vultures would disappear over to Africa and just spend spend a year or two just drifting around Africa before returning back to Spain to breed. Um, so yeah, they're, uh, you know they they they're, they're on their gap year, as someone said. Um, they're they're travellers. They're going out and they're exploring. If the air currents are right, there's no reason why we won't get more bearded vultures coming over. I don't think we'll get griffins unless the climate drastically alters, and I don't think we'll get black vultures. Um, Black vultures particularly don't tend to move that far, although some do cross the Straits in Gibraltar, most of them just stay within, within Spain. Um, but yeah, you, you never know. And um, I can remember when the first bearded vulture turned up, it flew past 
uh, this place is literally just a few miles down the road, you know, and I, I was out in um, Spain surrounded by Griffin vultures and hearing about Devon and, and a vulture, it was like, well, what's going on? Um, but yeah, as their population recovers in Europe and it's doing really, really well, you're going to have more youngsters being produced, more youngsters that will then start wandering. And if the air currents are right, you can guarantee a vulture will ride them. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, about uh, traveling, because I remember a couple of years ago that there was a bird, uh, um, a griff, uh, sorry, an Egyptian vulture that was satellite tagged um, somewhere in, in northern Spain or, you know, in the north somewhere. And that was tagged, I think, in spring. And by the October of that year, it had been to and fro Africa five times. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's 14 kilometers from um, Gibraltar to, um, to Africa. It's no distance, particularly for a bird that can just sail through the air on those big wings. So they do cross over. Um, they think that the reason why you're getting Rupel's vulture turning up in southern Spain and sometimes in Ex-Madura, it's an African species. But again, their youngsters wander and they actually think the griffin vultures, the young ones, when they cross over into Africa, they sort of meet up with the Rupel's vulture, similar, a closely related species, and they, they hang out together, they're flying around. And as the griffin vultures drift back, some of the repels vultures also drift back. And there's, there's been one or two definite breeding attempts with repels vulture in Europe now. It's, it will happen, sadly, because of what's happening in Africa with the poisoning, repels vultures are rapidly heading for extinction. So the ones that we're getting uh, drifting into Europe, um, you've got to hope for their sake, they may actually stay and breed. Now, let's talk about what they eat. Um... When you think of vultures, you think, well, we educate, we're educated in the subject. But I mean, for example, my sister, who's not a birder, in fact, she denied the presence of birds for most of her life. She came up to see me next to Medjuda and I, I said, look, there's a bunch of vultures above her. And she was cowering behind a rock saying they're going to eat me. How often do they need to eat? And is it a case that the animal needs to be dead first? Um. Vultures are carrion feeders, so they feed on, generally feed on dead animals. It may well be that perhaps an animal um, isn't quite dead, it may be very, very ill, and the vultures come down to investigate. But the vast majority of times, it feeds on, on, on dead animals. So I'm talking about European vultures, I don't have the experience of American vultures, but from what I've read, they're the same sort of thing. Um, there is some controversy. There's a lot of farmers that say they, that vultures pursue and chase and kill cows. I've never seen any evidence to back that up. I've seen plenty of cows chasing vultures. And um, in my book, I've got uh, uh, some pictures of that, of cows chasing vultures that are on the ground. Cows don't like them. It must be quite unsettling to um, one week watch um, a dead carcass of, of, of your herd be consumed and then see these vultures wandering around in the field. So. Vultures don't put up a fight, they go, they don't, you know, they're scared of them. Um, so their carcass feeders, they're, they're cleaners up, they feed on carrion, they feed on, de on, on dead creatures. Interestingly, the black vulture will feed on small dead creatures, so they'll feed on a dead rabbit or dead fox at the roadside, whereas griffins tend to go for the bigger carcasses. Um, so size isn't necessarily a key to what sort of thing they'll feed on. And I've, I've set up trail cameras next to Madura, I've put um, literally bits of chicken carcass that I brought at the um, at the supermarket, put it out with a trail camera in the hope that I'll get beech martin or um, Egyptian mongoose feeding. And I've had black vulture come down and, and take them, just small little bits, I mean, ridiculous sized bits. So they'll, they'll find the food. Um, griffin vultures in particular are very good at conserving energy. And in bad weather, they'll sit on the cliffs. They won't fly. And, you know, seven, eight days, they can survive without feeding. They'd rather not. I mean, I think they can go nine, ten, even more than that without feeding. They'd rather not. They'd rather eat every two or three days. But um, they have this amazing constitution, which means that, you know, they can always shut down their metabolism. They can slow their bodies down, what their bodies are doing to conserve energy. And if you look at the fledging dates for chicks, and, in, you know, if you pick up the birds of the, West, of the um, Western Palearctic, instead of it being a precise date, it's, it can be sort of 15 to 20 days from the, the, the quickest date they fledge to the longest date they fledge. And that's dependent on weather. So if the adults haven't been able to get food, the chick switches off its metabolism, it stops growing. Now we couldn't do that, we die. 
uh, but vultures are capable, you know, blackbird chicks in the nest couldn't do that, they die, but vultures, they can, they just shut themselves down, they, they can, we can't, it's very hard to comprehend, basically they don't need to eat all the time. Amazing, so listen, what is your favourite species of vulture? How, if, how many species are there in the world, by the way? I mean, we need to talk about this a bit, a bit more, maybe in the Q&A bit, because I've, you know, I've read a lot about the, the the vultures in the new world versus the old world vultures, and people are saying that the ones in the new world are more closely related to storks and cormorants, whereas our birds are more related to eagles. But are you going to include the new world vultures in your favourite vulture list? Well, my, my uh, well, to answer your first question, there's 23 species of, um, of vulture in the world. Seven of those are new world vultures, and 16 of them are um, what we call old world vultures. And the whole stork thing came about from just one paper that was published, but got a lot of traction. It's since been proved with um, DNA analysis that they're not related to storks. They are actually um, birds of prey. Um, but they are very, they're very unrelated to the old world vultures. They're not closely related at all. It just so happens that they've evolved a similar niche and we've just called them vultures. It's us that have called them vultures. They're a different type of bird though, but they are, they are raptors as opposed to being storks. Um, my favorite um, vulture of all has got to be the griffin, just purely because of seeing it when I saw it that time. Um, I'll put it back up. That's my, that's my favorite vulture. I just, but they're just fantastic. You see them, as you said, you can see them in, in cities. You can see, I can come out of my front door in the morning before I go up to pick the clients up and I look out and there's a griffin boat drifting overhead. I can be sat on the, on the, the patio with a gin and tonic in the evening. There's a griffin boat drifting overhead. You can be out in the, in the wilds, there's griffin vultures around. They're just fantastic birds. And watching them fly, just switch up. You know, if you get the chance to see vultures, just switch off your mind and just lie back and vote your gaze. And you won't be disappointed. Everything can empty out of your head. They're brilliant. So yeah, for me, the Griffin Vulture is by far my favorite vulture. And if you could be anywhere on this planet, not, notwithstanding impending wars or wars or COVID, where would you be? Well, apart from being at um, St. James's Park, watching Exodus City play, it's got to be the, um, the Salor Valley, which um, is here. The Rio Salor is an ex Madura river. It flows into the Tahoe and, and that takes it to um, uh, the Atlantic in Portugal. Most of the rivers in um, ex Madura are dammed, but the Rio Salor isn't. Where it, has, it does have dams, but this section of it isn't dammed. It's a flowing river. Um, it does often run out of water because there's hardly any rainfall in the summer. But for me, this place is paradise. It's, um, it's on the edge of the village uh, where I live, and I'm, I'm sure Elias recognises this photo. It's, it's just beautiful. You don't see a soul. You can go, you can spend the entire day there, and it's right off the main road, and you won't see anyone. But you've got kingfishers zipping up and down. You've got terrapins. You've got vipering snakes in the water. Me and my wife have sat there in the middle of the day watching otters swim around. It's just, it's just mind blowing because in Britain you don't see otters doing that in the middle of the day. There's no one there to disturb them. You've got uh, griffin vulture, black vulture, Egyptian vulture, all breeding very close by. They're constantly in the sky. Uh, you've got Spanish imperial eagle breeding there. You've got golden eagle breeding there. Uh, azure wing magpies, blue rock thrush, black wheat ear, which is another brilliant bird. There's so much life going on there. It's just fantastic. And sitting there, watching the vultures overhead, having a nightingale deafen you in, in the tree next to you, just singing its heart out. I can't think of a better place. I've been to lots of places in the world, but that one site, that's where I just want to be. Well, I must say you've sold Extra Madura very well. I mean, it's a, it is an amazing place. And if you haven't been before, you must find yourself down here um, and have a look around. Now, Zoomers, let me just quickly tell you what's coming up over the next weeks um on uh the 17th of january uh, we have a guy called dr alex lees and he's actually done some very interesting research into vagrancy why do birds turn up as vagrants and he's got some very interesting theories on that so we're going to be talking about it plus he's written a book about vagrancy in birds 
So we'll be chatting to him on December, well, not in December, January the 17th, so I'm thinking about Christmas still. Um, on the 24th of January, uh, we have a, a young man called Diego Calderon, uh, who comes from um, Colombia, and he has lived through all the stuff that you've seen on TV, all of series on the violent series on the drug lords and stuff. He's lived through all that stuff, and he's going to give a, a, a talk basically on uh, the FARC in Colombia and how that affected birds and birding. Very, very fascinating. You must join us for that. And um, on January the 31st, uh, my old friend John Dunn is back. He was here um, last year chatting about hummingbirds. Now he's back, or we will be back on the 31st of January talking about orchids, which is one of his great loves. Keep an eye out on the In Conservation with um, list of uh, people coming along because there's going to be a whole load more between now and when we finish the series. So thank you very much also for, for joining us for the previous ones and for this one. And a couple of things just to mention, um, we've got a couple of online courses starting uh, one in February and one in March. The one in February will be with Keith Betton, who's a, um, a broadcaster, but also a public speaker. And he's going to be giving uh, or leading a course, for online course for three weeks on how to do, how to be a public speaker in the world of conservation, which is a very important tool. As you can imagine and in March we have the great David Tipling who is a fantastic bird photographer doing an online course on urban bird photography you've got to investigate those absolutely and don't forget you can get a discount if you are a member of the urban bird world so on that note I'd like to thank you Ian for giving up your evening here or there in Devon to chat about your love I know you can speak about it all night but thank you so much for chatting um, and you got a new book coming out called the uh, called Seasonality. Yes, yeah, Seasonality is coming out. Uh, it'll be in the spring. It's about British wildlife. It's about uh, British wildlife through the seasons, um, what it's doing, why it's doing it, how it makes me feel. It's my personal view of wildlife. There's a lot of opinion in it. Um, a lot of things annoy me about how we manage our land in this country. Um, but above all, it's a it's a positive, optimistic look at our wildlife in Britain through the seasons. So that's coming out. I think it's probably coming out end of April, beginning of May, and that's with Whittles Publishing. Fantastic. Zoomers, thank you very much once again for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing you all another time. Until then, keep looking up. <laughs>